Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Decoded by Threado AI, where we explore uh, journeys and philosophies of customer and community leaders and get their perspectives on AI in this rapidly evolving field. I'm Pramod, your host today, and I have Neil Travis, um, the host of uh, Growth Support Podcast with us here. Growth Support is a platform dedicated to facilitating growth for customer support professionals. And, and Neil comes with an extensive background in customer support, but I'll let I mean, Neil introduce himself and we'll, then we'll jump into the questions after that. Neil, over to you. Yeah, tell us a <laughs> bit more about yourself. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. For me, my history, where I come from, I would say I don't have a super extensive, crazy, long background in a deep experience like many of my peers. Uh, but about five years ago, uh, I came from the United States and I moved to the Netherlands. Uh, and originally when I was in the States, I came from a uh, long background of service roles in retail uh, and retail sales. Uh, when I came over to the Netherlands, I jumped into my first startup uh, organization. I started at the Academy to Innovate HR when it was eight people. Uh, we're growing very quickly, and now we're up to 85 people plus uh, over the past four and a half years. And since that time, I've worked on everything customer. And when you're eight people, you wear a lot of different hats, and you jump into everything uh, when it comes to the scaling business. So. My focus really there has been building the scalable foundation for customer support and our customer experience. And for that, along that journey, I never had a dedicated, specific mentor who had really full experience in this. So one of my motivations for starting growth support was I'm having so many conversations with people along the way, really trying to learn for myself through networking, through talking to people. One of the ideas that I had was I'm having all of these conversations it might as well be useful for other people as well. So it's one of the motivations that I started to get into sharing that knowledge with people and hopefully it can help them as well. Amazing. Best way to actually learn is from folks who have done it before and conversations like these go a long way in updating our own model. So great to learn about how it, um, it inspired you to start the podcast. Uh, I'm curious to know a bit about what have you observed over the years in terms of how the customer support landscape has changed or maybe not changed right like from a thirty-five thousand feet view how has it been in terms of what are you observing over the last decade or so? so when i have jumped in i think the fundamentals of support have stayed relatively the same in terms of really delivering an experience mm -hmm. that people will build customer loyalty will build value what i think the big shift and changes have been over the past, you say, decades, uh, for me specifically looking in the microscope of the last five years, uh, would be convenience, really, really focusing on making it a very convenient experience and really cutting down a lot of the process. How do we streamline it a lot more to make sure that our customers can reduce as much friction for them as possible to maximize value and make sure that they're getting that quickly and mm -hmm. easily? Uh, number two, Really, I think the rise of support operations, specifically having a focus on making that more efficient, making sure that we can automate as much as possible without sacrificing that customer experience uh, has gone a long way. And thirdly, the rise of SaaS, I think, has made support more of a unique selling point where support becomes an actual value driver and a reason why people choose your company over others as well. Amazing. I think, and you, like you mentioned, you've seen or experienced like support in the early stages to like, you know, a scale a setup as well. Curious to know your own philosophy of how to deliver great customer support. You also mentioned that the fundamentals have not changed. So when you look at support, what would be those, some of the fundamentals there? How has it been in the past for you in the support of teams that you work with? I think... If you look at it externally from a customer's perspective, delivering great support really is about creating that convenient experience where if it is something that they should be able to do on their own, they can. Uh, and if it's not something where they do need to be able mm -hmm. to get help, that experience is personal and a very human experience in terms of making sure that we take their unique situation into account. We can work with a person. 
I think my philosophy has always been at the end of the day, we're all people just interacting with people and that should be a real and authentic experience because we're all living life in the same situation. Of course, our situations are unique, but uh, we're all people at the end of the day and we shouldn't try to make it a very, hey, this is you and this is me kind of experience. Uh, so really taking that personality into account yeah. makes a really good experience. How do you do that at scale? That's always the interesting question. I have developed a bit yeah. of a methodology for myself around what is the core work that we as reps and we should really be spending our time on, where we really want to interact with our customers. What is the busy tasks that we should just reduce and automate and that we should really start to bring down uh, to make it a much more convenient experience and how you approach really building that foundation is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, in our last podcast, I'd spoken to Dave from Buffin, and they have a philosophy that they, they have no canned responses. Like you said, it's about each person's situation is very different. How you handle it is the experience that you deliver to the customer. But yeah, as you said, scaling it is the magic sauce, I think. So I'd love to like double click on that. You mentioned support operations emerge as one of the themes, right? And you also had a podcast, I think, around managing the tech stack in support ops before. So what are some insights on this role or action of support ops? How has it evolved and where does it add value today? Yeah, that's today? a great question. For me, the way that I look at support operations is two things that make it really primarily focused. One is how do we reduce friction, uh, not only for our customers, but also for our internally as well. And number two, how do we start maximizing and adding value yeah. across the board? This should be the goal. The more efficient you can make it, the more value that you can add, of course, to a limit. The way that I approach it is I look at what are the volume of things that we're working on and how long does it take us to handle them or how complex are these different topics. That breaks things into a nice two by two matrix of volume and handle time or complexity. I've seen it go both ways, where in the top left, you have very busy tasks, things that are very administrative, very open uh, in a sense of just clicking a lot of boxes and moving forward. In the bottom left, you have easy answers, things that are very informational, things that are, hey, there is documentation on them. Uh, there's not a lot of it, and we can handle it very quickly. It's just kind of FAQ focused a bit. On the right-hand side, you have where we want humans to be spending their focus and really dedicating that nuanced look. So in the top right, where you have a high volume of things and it takes you a long time to deal with them or it's very complex, you have your core work. That's the core of what you want to spend your time on in support. And in the bottom portion where it's low volume, uh, but it takes it's very complex or you have a high handle time, those are things that are very nuanced. It could be a very bug that you see is very complex. You have to spend a lot of time on investigation. How do you handle that? Mm -hmm. So this is what I would describe as the support landscape, is this breakdown. What I see as the role of support operations is how do you deal with that landscape? How do you actually focus on okay. moving things from the top right to the bottom left of getting them off the board a bit? Of course, you'll never mm -hmm. zero. Uh, how do you start doing that? At the core of the work, if we want to move things from unstructured problems or issues, start to structure them very clearly, it's very step by step, they become busier tasks. They become, hey, now the mm. process is very clear, I'm just clicking buttons. That comes through process and documentation and standard operating procedure and making things more standardized. If then you want to say, okay, now it's a busy task, we've structured it, it's very clear. Now, how do we start to automate it? And then through automation or self-service or AI, for example, uh, we can start to reduce the volume and it's just informational answers whenever they need. So how do you start navigating those things uh, there as well? If you want to reduce the core of what we're doing, we would just want to reduce the volume of it to where maybe it's a sign-in issue, for example. We're dealing with a lot of sign-in issues because the product mm -hmm. is just not set up fully and crisp and clean. How do we start to really make sure you fix the product uh, at the core? That way, when you do get sign-in issues, they really are those nuanced problems that really do need a high level of focus. And then how do you start to move those? And how do we start to deal with them better? Education, training, 
We make sure that the reps have all of the skills and competencies that they need to deal with them better. Uh, and then they become a bit more closer towards the easy answers and things like that. So I think the complexity of it really, really depends on your specific focus. But yeah, this is a very long answer to a short question. This, I would say, is how I approach no, it. No, amazing. I, yeah. I love the two by two framework. And I think um, there are a lot of themes emerging from that I'd love to uh, segue into. One is you also touched upon automation and AI um, helping some of the move from one bucket to another. Where do you see AI specifically have the most impact? And where are you seeing right now? And, and maybe five years down the line, what it might look like. In that two by two matrix, where do you see the most impact today that AI can come in and add value to the support ops? I would function? say where yeah. it can have the most impact would be moving from those busy, very high volume, very type of administrative tasks towards easy answers, and then the self-service aspect as well. So mm -hmm. very much on the left side of that matrix, uh, where we do want there to be a much more system yeah. focus because everything is very standardized. You would, What I would hate to see is that it becomes a solution for complex issues where this AI is trying to figure something, but he has a very, hey, I had this very specific and personal experience that the AI can't deal with that uh, in a sense. So where I see it having the most yeah. impact would be one, how do we have it do, hey, I am missing my order number for this. Okay, it looks it up, it gives it to you, it gives you a fuller, uh, or it can reference your support knowledge base articles to be able to give a standardized answer to a very standardized or common question. Uh, in this way, I think it can be giving a much more, not like a chatbot where it's giving you just very standard scripted canned response type answers, but a little bit more of that personal, like lively yeah. experience for customers at the same time, giving you the actual standard information that you have. I think in my opinion, this is where it brings the most. Now you see a lot of advancements in generative example where yeah. I think if you really do feed good content into it you could create a much more proactive and engaging experience where, hey, based on these identifiers of a customer journey of how they're interacting with our product, we're going to send a, a generative message to them personal to how they're interacting with it. Hey, we see that you're engaging in this part of our product. This would be really you know, an additional value for you or how you can handle it better. This kind of thing, I think, could also be a very good driver of value yeah. from AI. Yeah, that's very interesting. So it's more like proactive support, knowing patterns from before that, hey, this is a behavior and maybe they need help with this. That's challenging yet. I think if we do, if that's done well, then customer delight would obviously be not just higher. Exactly. Uh, if they're able we to we have well. a learning yeah. product to innovate yeah. HR. And I think one of the you know, okay. benefits yeah. of it could be, hey, I want to craft a learning journey for myself or how can I learn better interacting with a new GPT or something like this can be a beneficial experience of, I want to get a digital learning coach. Okay, here's a generative experience mm. that can add value. Yeah, got it. In your matrix, you also mentioned about the complex problems, right? Where it could be something like there's repeat queries around login issues or which probably the product team needs to fix. Going in the direction, like, what's your advice on how support leaders and product teams can um, work more collaboratively because the product team is usually working on the roadmap ahead um, while the support team is getting a lot of questions on the existing, the current or the past roadmap product uh, rollouts. So there's always a clash on that the product team wants to like check things while support team is coming with, here are things that are that need to be fixed for existing customers. So how do we manage the balance the there? <laughs> I think if you think <laughs> about how you structure yeah. customer interactions, there's so much information there that can be valuable to close that feedback loop to product and say, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is the impact that we have on it. And really, if we can fix this for customers, this is what it means in terms of their experience and that, again, reducing friction side of things as well. Using that same two by two matrix that I use, we can identify some of these issues and say, hey, our support team is spending a lot of time on this. What are customers saying about it and how can we actually go about fixing it? And there we can say, hey, 
we spend this much time on it. This is what it kind of costs us if you're looking at financial ROI. Uh, this is what customers are saying about it, and this mm-hmm. is what's going wrong. If we fix it, and then we actually push this as a priority, it's going to reduce volume of tickets and time that our support team spends on it it's going to improve the customer experience because they can do this and this and from a business standpoint bottom line it means we're saving this much money by actually fixing the product Uh, so you get the full outcomes there in order to do that you need two things one a really good relationship with your product team two really good data to sort through those interactions and what the customers are saying uh, and the sentiment around it as well so i think big voice of the customer program good tag taxonomy and structure in place and a good relationship with your product teams can go a very long way. Yeah. Cool. I love that if you're able to communicate ROI and use data effectively, like how you mentioned that here's the time and cost linked to this set of issues that the support team is facing. And if you, if we saw this could be the impact and experience, I think that then it's a logical discussion on, okay, how do we solve it? And I don't think the friction would increase between the teams. I had a parallel question to this. So one of the things then so it's support driven conference, I met several support leaders. I think a common theme um, that people wanted to learn more about was how can we um, communicate internally about the impact support function has, um, especially in an environment like today's right where uh, everybody's cost conscious and wants AI to come in and be more help everyone be more efficient. From your interactions with other support leaders, what do you think has come across as here are best practices what support leaders do to communicate internally or champion support teams internally, like, what, like maybe with the CFOs or the CEOs as well. What are some best practices for support leaders? Listen to your other stakeholders, I would say, is a huge one. Uh, Because, for example, if you're just, Mm -hmm. you have really good data, if you're able to leverage data, and without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So there, if you do and ought to have really good data, you need to be able to understand which of that data is the most valuable to your other stakeholders internally. I understand that we love all of the data we can get our hands on, being able to understand everything that's going on with customers. And we can say so much about the customer experience, but if your other stakeholders don't care about that and they only have focuses on certain data and information, leverage that. Speak just like how we wanna speak uniquely to our customers, we need to also speak uniquely to our internal customers to drive value for them. Uh, And being able to find that balance is really important be able to speak the language of your stakeholders and listen to what they need can help you to build that relationship more because you're actually saying, hey, this is good information. There's an example that I have from one of the conversations that I had on growth support with Rios. He said, Mm -hmm. I went to give a report to my other stakeholders and I said, here's all the information to my engineering team. You guys launched a new product. Here's our, this is how many calls we had. This is what, how we handled them. This is how it went. And then the engineering team asked, so is that good? Or is that bad? What is that good or bad? What's going on? There's, yeah. there is like flat information and then there's meaningful information that you can give. Being able to, un- how they perceive it and what they want to perceive is very important. Be able to develop storytelling skills, be able to listen to your stakeholders. These are very important. Yeah. Of it. I think data and um, Kinsey, another support leader, he at this point, which is around love language uh, of the stakeholder. So knowing how to storytell, but for that function or the stakeholder is equally important. Great example. Then, yeah, coming to you mentioned about the pod, like any other you know, instances or from you've spoken to like several support leaders, are there like highlight? couple of highlights from episodes that, that have stayed with you and why? <laughs> I love this question. Yes, there are a lot of highlights. I think one of the big things that I've learned, I think metrics and how, what we measure and why we measure it and how we measure it is becoming extremely relevant and important across the board. I think it's important for everybody to be able to understand mm-hmm. that we're going from a culture where support or service teams are seen as very much cost center but we really really want to be a value driver and being shown for that value that we offer i think this is a big theme yeah. one of the funny things that i found not just around support and the themes there and the trends but 
one of the things in all my conversations is that people come from such a diverse background and support where they fall into it or come from a very different experience before uh, mm. and then they find love in it because there is so much opportunity there and value to be seen in these conversations that you have that's one of the funny things that i've noticed in all my conversations uh, number two I mean, everybody has really always had a conversation mm. around make sure that the information that happens in support is documented so that you can drive those outcomes later one of the things is if it's not written down, it never happens. And that goes the same for the value that you drive for internal stakeholders. If you want to show how support has changed and shaped the product experience and changed and shaped the way that customers experience your company, view your company, especially if you're selling support as a premium or it is a value driver for your company, yeah. you need to be able to tell that story and that journey of how it's improved and how it's shaped the experience. So definitely document, keep a history of all the things that have happened be able to speak the language of your other stakeholder and keep the community drive going. I would say these are big themes that I've learned. Got it. I'd love to ask a question around the communication to internal stakeholders, especially in remote teams, right? Like where you're not working as a support team in one office. Have you come across examples from, like you say, if, if it's not written, it's like hard to locate the impact. What are some best practices that you've come across or you've seen remote teams provide like exceptional support yeah great question because i don't come from a fully remote team myself uh, so we actually have a hybrid environment and a hybrid mm -hmm. where most of the time we are off in office and there one of my one of my colleagues said 90 percent of outcomes come from meetings that aren't meetings and aren't scheduled it just happened in the hallway you just pass and i think those mm -hmm. types of conversations don't happen yeah. in in remote teams per se so what i would say is maybe yeah. at least from my perspective reach out to people proactively a lot of times what i've seen is when since we're out, since we are hybrid when i do work with people who are working fully remote those conversations don't happen all the time and it's up to you to make sure that they do uh, reach out try and ask questions try and find out what's going on it doesn't need to be in a set cadence but just check in with people uh, and make sure that those outcomes that you're asking about you're finding out is documented be proactive about communication and also follow up. If you had a conversation about something maybe happening and it did happen, follow up with them, let them know what happened, let them know the outcome, let them know the action. I would say just be active in that communication. I think active is yep. covering both sides of it. People who just put their head Got down it. and yep. work and drive, it's not visible. Uh, so being in a remote team, you need that visibility to be extra prevalent in what you do. Correct. And uh, around the point you, you also mentioned like, you know, metrics is sort of, or like data and metrics is like core now to even communicate about impact. So curious to know if the metrics, how things were viewed before to now, have they changed? Support is usually when we think like first thing is like number of tickets and then first response times and so on. But is there a more holistic view rather than just these, let's say high level metrics that you come across yeah. that has evolved over time? Because the shift has happened where we're really focusing on value over efficient, efficiency is really important, but where we're really focused on drivers from it, because we have such a focus on outcomes now, yeah. the view of metrics has changed to where there needs to be separated between a couple of different buckets of metrics where you have, these are efficiency and operational metrics. This is just what's happening. Uh, and it's not focused on what the yeah. fuller outcome is versus those larger outcome value-oriented metrics. Uh, like I saw a fun one uh, that was number of product changes based on support actionable items is as a metric, which is much more nice. outcome than value-oriented than yeah. it is just a, this is, we had 300 tickets. We had 3,000 tickets. This, like, that doesn't tell you what or why it's happening. It does tell you what's going on, and that's yeah. very important to keep in mind. How is How are we running efficiently? It is an important topic to keep in mind, but at the same time, shifting your focus, especially towards internal stakeholders when we're talking about understanding their love language, what do they want to know? Yeah. Create metrics around that, uh, and those are going to outcome and proactive metrics that you would want to measure. Amazing. 
And you mentioned one of them, like for example, product changes based on support feedback. Are there others that you think people can consider, um, which is beyond the standard operational metrics, even yeah, if it's qualitative? There are a lot. I would say the more that you drive outcomes in that way, the more nuance it gets a little bit. And being creative in those, I think understanding the why first behind them yep. uh, would be the most important thing. Off the top mm -hmm. of my head, I wouldn't say that I have some very specific go-to ones uh, per se, but no, uh, yeah. definitely a good mm -hmm. resource for them. Uh, in support driven, I know there's also a lot of conversations around these types of creative and outcome oriented yeah. metrics. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, just coming back to the point around AI and where it can add value. So I, I think so far it's mostly been um, around self serve support that gets most of the visibility. AI can help reduce the ticket volume or self serve support. I'm curious to know a bit more on how should support leaders think of AI, not just on the customer facing side, but also even the uh, support agents or support team. AI could enable them to be better and improve. What are the opportunities um, and, and for AI or two that support leaders should think of like for not just customer side, but also like you know, in internal question. team side of things? I think for this one, sentiment analysis, huge. Uh, if you can start to measure sentiment mm -hmm. and customer interactions, you can start training agents on how they can shift their conversation or language based on how the customer is being interpreted. If you can get a good sentiment analysis in there, you can say, okay, maybe the customer is starting to escalate in their sentiment. Maybe we need to move towards further exceptions or something like this. Obviously, that's a lot of fine tuning in a very advanced use case, I think. <laughs> Another yeah. thing, coaching. Coaching and training is a really good way to use AI because it can be a very good customer in a sense. If you need it to role play in a certain way yeah. so that agents can practice new skills before going live, that's a good way and a good opportunity where you can create maybe a training bot to give them certain situations to practice in or advanced troubleshooting techniques. This could be a very good opportunity. Uh, another one that I've already seen in practice is being able to look up information for example there's a company that has a slack bot that you ask hey uh, i'm looking for this information can you look it up and it asks you hey do you want me to just give you an article that shows it or do you want me to craft a summarized response or answer for you and you can choose yeah i just want to summarize answer and then it gives you all the information in a ai generated response versus the article itself so it's a blend a little Got bit it. i think those are three larger use cases and very mm -hmm. successful for internal and agent experience. Yeah, love it. I think, so we, we do the third bucket as well. So essentially we, we help harness information that's scattered across the organization, in different places, and then surface it inside of Slack. And we, we have a Chrome extension coming up, right? For the agents, but I love the other two use cases, which is essentially helping the team get better training, um, getting to like as a role play or just assisting them real time in between a call, let's say, or as the chat is going on. I think we'll start seeing some of these uh, solutions come in as well. I just saw a product which does this for sales, where you can have a call with an artificial you know, intelligent sales salesperson and have a cold call that trains you. So <laughs> yeah, like, very interesting. And I'm sure soon they may be just complete autonomous sales calls, which we can't recognize as human or AI based, uh, sometimes soon. Yeah. So I think concern around um, security, but yeah, like before getting into just the safety and security side of things, like what, while AI brings a lot of promise, what have you discovered are some of the apprehensions of using AI in customer support today uh, from your interactions with other support leaders? Yeah. On um, I asked the question around specifically, you get what you pay for in terms of cost. Some people can think it's a version. Some people can think of, or the flip side of it, hey, with so many cheap solutions out there to get started with AI and get that crash course in there, how do I ensure that it is actually following compliance, following safety? Uh, and so we got some advice on that, uh, on growth support as well of AI safety and how to get started mm -hmm. with it. Uh, I think some of the other apprehensions are, mm -hmm. is my support team mature enough to be able to implement it and how can I implement it? 
because it seems like a very daunting task. Yeah. Uh, but how do you get started with it simply? I think the really important thing is making sure that you have the fundamentals in place first. Do we have actually a good self-service and help center experience? To do we have standardized metrics and standardized ticket types and ticket issues? Or is it very all over the place yeah. in terms of the things that we're doing? It depends on the maturity of your org, uh, I think as well. There are ways to get started and simply, but if you want to do it very well and create an engaging experience, I think that's something to consider. Do you have the foundations in place? Yeah, makes sense. And um, with these, some of apprehensions coming in and people being aware of AI needs to be implemented, but you need the foundations to be stronger to be able to do that. Do you also see over time the skill sets required for customer support professionals change more toward maybe curation of knowledge base uh, rather than in the past, like you would spend a lot of time on repeat query. You know, one one segment is that you, if you do the help center really well, then that may get resolved right now, for example. So do you see the skill sets change and any potential directions it might go in going ahead? Um, yeah, so I think that it puts a little bit more pressure on knowledge workers in a sense to make sure that that information is correct and, and is available. In terms of the way that support agents themselves interact with it, it becomes a little bit less of, yeah. hey, let's make sure, especially for example, in quality assurance, how do you use QA AI to be able to measure if that experience is going well? That perspective shifts a little bit from let's have amazing interactions and let's push to making sure that the AI is performing, the quality is performing well, that is accurate. So you take a little bit more of a solution approach than just a reactive, hey, I'm just going to focus on tackling everything that I can do. I think it also makes the skill level a little bit deeper. I think the more that you start to utilize automation and AI to take care of a lot of tier one type things, you're going to need people who are a little bit more focused on those deeper competencies in terms of having a more process-oriented, solution-oriented mindset, being able to be a little bit more architects of these types of solutions. It's difficult to say that, I don't want to say that baseline level of experience is deeper, but I would say that the skill ceiling is higher yeah. uh, in terms of the things that you should be able to do. You need deeper competencies to be able to grow and be more successful in support for sure. And with AI in the mix and like support ops coming more and more important uh, today, what is your view on the tech stack for today's support team? How, what's your thinking on here are must have critical ones, right? And what would be additional things that you've seen? What's a typical tech stack that Ooh, we should be looking at? Question. I think it's very unique to the organization. I think it's one of those, I don't want to give a cop out answer, but it yeah. depends. <laughs> like it, it really depends on your product, what you're offering and how you're offering it. Uh, for sure. Definitely you need a place that you can have as a full service center. For sure, you need a CRM to be able to understand all of the things that are going on with your customer, the journey, the types of interactions that they're having. The more, I, I don't want to give a specific tech stack or tools that they need because, again, it's very unique to the company. At the same time, some yeah. baseline level of things, you need to understand who your customer is, where they're coming from, how, what they're doing, uh, and what their journey is like. If you can understand more the behavioral aspect of how your customers are coming in and be able to fully service them in the way that they want to be serviced, and the better under, the better you can understand your customer in that way, the better you can start to utilize the technology that you have to deliver a better experience, even if that includes AI, uh, for sure. So... For me, mm -hmm. right now, the baseline level tech stack that we need, or we have our service center that includes a help center documentation, self-service experience, 100%, yeah. definitely need it. Number two, uh, as real-time experience as possible, in, in my opinion, it really depends on your customer and product. At the same time, the more closer you can get to a yeah. real-time experience, whether that be a self-service experience or an uh, agent experience, the more convenient it is for your customer and that convenience goes a long way and then i don't want to say a source of truth because source of truth is uh, always an ever-changing thing depending on what your tech stack looks like 
but somewhere where you can be able to see what those behaviors are and what your customer needs are. Voice of the customer, self-service, full service sensor, try and get real mm -hmm. time, and voice of the customer so you can understand their needs. Baseline minimum. <laughs> No, yeah, I think, uh, and you're right, it depends a lot on uh, each company's in, with the product, the requirement, and how they can service it as well. One question on that is the uh, emergence of newer forms of support, which would be like Slack, Connects, and uh, there's obviously Live Chat, which a lot of companies move away from just email support to like Live Chat experience. What are your observations? Are you seeing more and more companies adopt a particular channel more today like i'm just saying like we, we provide support to our customers over slack connect for example we have live chat as well they can reach out to us on email so there are multiple channels but uh, yeah curious to know from your perspective what, what are you observing i would say it really focuses on the channels that your customers needs but more so the the channel mm -hmm. measure because for example slack what it used to be versus what it is today in terms of customer support with all these integrations of new tools. I see a lot of tools coming out that starts turning Slack into a service center. The reason it yeah. wasn't like that before was because it's not measurable. It's super messy. Things just happen there. You can't control the experience. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very, very close to your company and your customer where instead of oh yeah, we have an SLA of 24 hours. We're going to be able to help you. It's a much more personal and one-to-one -one experience. Hey, I'm in your Slack. I have you. I can see when you're online. I know when you're there, <laughs> this kind of thing. How close you want to be becomes the question. For that, I think it's important to understand and realize that you need to meet your customers where they want to be met. I'm not going to hold to just, a, I'm not going to introduce a live phone channel for people to call me at any time, anywhere, if there's no demand for it. Uh, because, for example, like it really depends on what your customer need is to be able to open those channels. For the shift in tech stack, I think these live channels are really important because of convenience. Uh, but being able to measure them is also important. Because if you can't measure them, how are you going to measure the impact of those outcomes that we talked about earlier to your internal stakeholders? Yeah, we offer Slack support. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Why? What is it? Is it doing well? Is it going well? Are we getting value out of that? This, I would say, is the more important part about the channels. And when you look at um, the tech stack and specifically in terms of AI tools that are emerging, right? How do you evaluate AI tools today, given it's crowded? Then there are newer tools every week and that emerge are there apart from like the generative capability are there things that you know, support leaders should keep in mind because they i'm sure they're all bombarded with a lot of tools for demos and how should they think about like where in the matrix and what are some expectations from the ai tools what have you seen or like how do you yeah, tools I today? explored yeah. the ai tool space myself in terms of i'm really invested in what's going to be yeah. the best for me because Again, we're building the foundations for it first. We need to have all of our foundations in place in order to be able to implement yeah. that. If I were to say my experience just as a bystander to the market, uh, some of the things that I would keep in mind when I do start looking for that would be, one, can I make sure that the experience is controllable and what I want it to be for our customers? Because everything should always depend on what your customers mm -hmm. We are the voice of our customer, right? So it's what they need. It's how we want that experience yeah. to be yeah. for them. If I'm going to implement an AI tool that just doesn't allow me to give them our experience, then I want to find one that can. And what is offered, I think, with the vast majority being flooded in the market right now for it, there is a lot of options around that. Cost is always important. Uh, yeah. Being able to understand is that cost the value that I'm getting for it? Being able to understand the ROI of that product. Number two, or number three, I would say is the capabilities in terms of how far can I push it? Because if I need four different AI okay. tools to do four different things, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to say, yes, I want that one, I want that one, I want that one, versus hey, this one AI tool and this capability and this capability that I can push for a longer time and make sure that we can scale it along with us. So the more options that one tool can offer, the better. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you have more options in the same tool, do those options perform as well as 
one tool that does one very specific thing very well, I would say that's also a good question to ask. Got it. Oh, perfect. Last thing I think I would love to know, where do you see support as a function? What are your predictions on some of the key trends or themes into 2024 around customer support? Yeah, would love to hear what excites you also in this space going ahead. Yeah, a couple yeah. of things that we already talked about, metrics and data are becoming much more important. Uh, support mm-hmm. is something I'm very passionate about because that's where I started from uh, in terms of my support journey and how I also approach our current scaling focuses. I think we also become in a much more interesting place where because we have now such a drive for being able to make our metrics more mature and make our data more mature, support becomes in a very interesting place where we can start to drive more business outcomes and become much more strategic partner. I know that there are some opinions that, hey, because a chief customer officer role exists, they have a seat at the table, we've done it. But at the same time, with now having so much more capabilities around what that experience looks like in terms of AI, in terms of just the amount and volume of tools and technology that we have at hand, the more we can craft those unique experiences to our customers and what they need, then that becomes much, much more interesting. Amazing. Thanks so much, Neil. Uh, This was super insightful. Looking forward to staying in touch, but thanks for taking the time. Um, This was amazing. Thank you.